Hello and welcome to another Fast Interview from New Zealand. Uh, I'm in New Zealand to, to cover their upcoming general election and while I'm here I'm chatting to a, a variety of candidates and activists to uh, learn about politics in New Zealand, what are the big issues uh, in this campaign and also probably most importantly for our viewers what Australia can learn from it. Now in New Zealand politics there are a lot of minor parties who are vying to get that 5% of the party vote which will get them uh, seats in New Zealand's parliament uh, under their mixed member proportionate uh, system. Uh, one of those parties is the Opportunity Party, or as they also like to be called, TOG. It is a party founded quite recently uh, by New Zealand businessman uh, Gareth Morgan. And I'm lucky to be joined by today the, the def deputy leader of the uh, Opportunities Party, or TOG, uh, Jeff Simmons. Thank you for chatting with the Unshackled. Good Tim. Now, your slogan is uh, not left, not right, but what works. Yeah. So, uh, there's a philosophy that um, I've come across during my years in politics called uh, radical centrism. Yeah. Uh, so, is that sort of a philosophy that you've adopted? Yeah, well, not, not ad adopted really. I think it's, uh, I, I do think it kind of fits where we are, where we are positioned, um, but that's, that's really through years of, uh, of policy development. So. Um, myself and the founder of the party, um, uh, businessman and philanthropist Gareth Morgan, as you mentioned, um, have both worked uh, on public policy for a number of years and uh, have advised you know, various governments about how uh, New Zealand could be a better place. Uh, and we just got a bit bored, really, of having politicians not listen to us or sort of say that the ideas are not uh, are not politically viable. The public will never go for them, and so we decided to, to put them in front of the public as, as an option. Um, so yeah, it is it, it, it's that that agenda happens to be quite radically centrist, <laughs> uh, and and that we we you know agree very much with the goals and values of of Middle New Zealand, what they are trying to achieve. Um, but that we think that radical change is needed to, to actually achieve that. And, and as, as I mentioned, there's a, a lot of parties uh, vying for that 5% to, to get them into Parliament. What's been the, the party's strategy in this campaign to be heard amongst the rest? Yeah, well obviously social media has been a big part of our strategy and that because we are proposing quite different ideas, the mainstream media are simply not set up to be able to deal with those, you know, that sort of in-depth conversation that has been needed. So social media has been a massive part of our, of our campaign, as well as face-to-face. -face. So we have, uh, you know, we've got a, you know, a bunch of candidates and, we've, and, and Gareth himself has been touring the country. He's been around the entire country three times uh, during the campaign. Um, doing you know town hall events every night, so talking to people, answering their questions, quite different from a normal political event, which is kind of you know have a bit of a band come out, everyone applauds, the leader does a, some sort of uplifting, but basically a contentless speech, and everyone goes away feeling better about themselves. Gareth, uh, you know, I've done a few of those with him uh, as of other candidates. Gareth just stands up at the front, says. Uh, look, here's some of our ideas. Uh, ask, ask us about them. Ask me anything, uh, and and spends an hour and a half um, answering questions. Uh, and so it is quite different. Um, and and on social media, uh, we endeavour to respond to all questions, uh, and and that's just what we have to do if we're really trying to get across new ideas, new ways, new ways of looking at things. Now let's talk about uh, some of your policy agenda. Now um, I'm going to be straight up. There's some that I agree with. There's a, a lot of your platform which uh, which I don't agree with. You're uh, a pro business party. You want yep. uh, New Zealanders to be able to succeed, but you also want uh, heavy state intervention in health, uh, education, uh, and the environment. Uh, yep. Do you think that conflicts with uh, a free market economy or freedom in general? No, I mean I think I think that's um, that's you know anyone who thinks that's the case is you know that's quite a naive way of looking at things. You know neoliberalism uh, has been has been proven to be uh, you know a bit of a failure, frankly. The idea that free markets are uh, are effective, um, you know, hasn't really worked out uh, anywhere in in the world. And so I think 
you know, we, we go back to the to the old idea that uh, markets need to be free and competitive, you know. Uh, it's like a game of rugby or football, you know. Uh, I don't know what... Uh, yeah, we play those in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A a ARL or league or rugby, whatever you want to play. I mean, it needs a referee, it needs lines, it needs rules. Yes, we want everyone to play hard and be competitive, uh, but at the end of the day, it does need... Uh, it does need a referee to make it competitive, otherwise uh, the dirtiest player wins. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and I think I think we've seen that with, uh, you know, with, with markets. We want them to be free, but we want them to be competitive as well, and that means that they do need to be uh, well managed. Uh, and that, that, you know, means that we take care of externalities uh, and uh, in, in the areas where there is big market failure like um, health and education, that we have to make sure all all young people particularly get a decent start in life uh, so that we can actually so that they can fulfill their potential you know because um, it's actually been shown time and time again that that countries that that uh, have high rates of child po poverty actually cost themselves economic growth uh, because because those kids are not getting a decent start in life they're not able to fulfill their potential uh, and and that's ultimately what what we want. We want kids to be able to, you know, start a business, uh, pursue, uh, you know, whatever skills they need to, to pursue their career, um, and 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 be able to to really push that, you know, push push an innovative knowledge based economy forward. And you're also proposing a uh, a radical shake up of New Zealand's uh, system of government. You want a a written constitution along yeah. with a written uh, Bill of Rights and you also want to reintroduce uh, an upper house. Now, um, yeah. Yeah, New Zealand pretty much has the same Westminster system as Australia and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people who say the, the systems, you know, we're one of the freest open democratic societies, mm. you know, in the world, like mm. why, you know, go through this, what can be a risky process of change, why do you think that uh, this is needed? Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, on the constitution, there's, I mean, there's only really um, th three countries in the world that don't have a written constitution these days: U UK, Israel, and New Zealand. Um, so, uh, you know, I, th I think having a written constitution is uh, is, is is pretty standard. Um, you know, of course, it does take a process to get it right. You know, you don't want to end up with. Um, you know, uh, crazy gun laws in there like America or anything like that. Uh, you know, you have to be careful about what you're gonna what you're gonna put in this constitution. But, but I, I think it's increasingly uh, accepted in, in New Zealand, certainly by uh, you know um, a, a lot of our intelligentsia. That actually leaving everything to Parliament hasn't always given us the, the the greatest outcomes. And we have seen in recent years Parliament eroding human rights uh, quite quite substantially. So, um, so there's a growing. I think there's a there's a growing acceptance of, of the need for a for a constitution, um, and you know particularly in New Zealand, the the you know the big issue here is that sets us apart is the the Treaty of Waitangi, which is our founding document, uh, which was an agreement signed between uh, you know the um, the Indigenous Māori Society and the uh, and the uh, Pakeha um, arrivers, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the, the visitors, uh, we call them Manuhiri um, or Tau Iwi, and, uh, and the, the agreement basically was that, we, that each um, society would look after each other and give each other the, the opportunity to, to thrive. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't, you know, Pakeha society hasn't honoured that treaty uh, always, uh, and we're going through a process of, of trying to, you know, live up to that um, commitment. But you know, it, it is an it's an ongoing commitment, uh, and we do need to to sort of uh, you know enshrine enshrine that in the way that we we do things. So refreshing, you know, developing a constitution is an is an opportunity for us to update and refresh that agreement between Māori and Pākehā societies and, and work out what it means in a, in a 21st century country. Um, as to the upper house, I mean, I understand, you know, I can understand coming from Australia, you'd probably not want to have an upper house because I, I understand, uh, you know, the, 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 the state and federal system uh, having upper houses and both can lead to an awfully convoluted um, setup. But our, our perspective on an upper house 
you could call it call it a constitutional authority, call it an upper house. You know, um, that's that's kind of uh, semantics to us. It's not it's not about having something that can that can veto legislation. Uh, it's more about just having uh, a body that is in place that can review all legislation from a constitutional perspective uh, and highlight any issues that they see, so that at least the public are fully informed uh, about that uh, and. You know whether you do that through a parliamentary commissioner for you know for future generations or a upper house or, or whatever, um, you know that, that's that's really a matter of some debate about the best way to do that, and, and you know we'd be happy to have that conversation, but you, you do need some sort of New Zealand has no checks and balances, uh, and and uh, you know if if a parliamentary party has has majority in parliament then then they can do whatever they like at the moment uh, and, and we don't think that's a, that's a great way to, 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 to run a country because there are some things that are fundamental. And another one of your policies is to uh, completely eradicate fossil fuels by 2050. Yeah. Now, uh, in Australia at the moment, we're, we're seeing the, the consequences of the transition to renewable energy. I mean, we've had one of our states, South Australia, suffer a, a statewide blackout uh, at the end of last year, uh, power prices mm. uh, continue to rise, mm. uh, how can you guarantee that you know, that won't, the Australian experience wouldn't happen in New Zealand as well? Yeah, I mean it's, uh, it's, it's certainly not something that you can achieve overnight, it's not an easy thing to achieve uh, and you know there do need to be, uh, I mean we certainly don't have the technology to be fossil fuel free right now, I mean that's, that's absolutely the case. Uh, you know, we can we can go. We can certainly do better than we are doing right now in New Zealand. There's, you know, um, the government ha the, of the past nine years hasn't really done much uh, to, to progress us towards a fossil fu fuel free uh, future. So we could be doing better, but totally uh, accept that we don't have the technology to get 100% of the way there right now. Uh, and so, you know, part of this has to be about putting long term incentives in place for people to to innovate, uh, to know that that's ultimately where we're heading uh, and, and uh, you know, so that people have the incentive to, to, to innovate to, to get there. Uh, I mean, on um, renewable energy and the energy system uh, in particular, I mean, the issue that New Zealand has, quite different to Australia actually, our, our energy system is, is, um, is, is already mostly renewable and, and we're just trying to get that last 20% of uh, of fossil fuel generation out of the system. Uh, but the issue that we have, t totally the opposite to you guys, your peak uh, demand is in the middle of summer, uh, in the middle of the day, right? Because of air conditioning, basically. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, our, our biggest um, demand is 6 p.m. in the middle of winter when everyone gets home from work. It's cold, they put on the heater and they're cooking their dinner at the same time. So that's, that's kind of... Um, you know, we have to have a think about how do you, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is solar can't possibly be the answer here because in the, in the middle of winter, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, you know, solar is no good. So we do have to think about um, the, the energy mix and the sorts of incentives that are going to get us to that, uh, to that ultimate goal. Yeah. Oh, I'd probably suggest that you look closely at what's happening uh, in Australia with our energy crisis and yeah, uh, maybe use that to fine tune your, your policies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, happy. Uh, we're always happy to learn from, from overseas experience for sure. Um, and you know, uh, I I even though you guys have, like I said, you, do, you guys have quite different energy uh, demands, I'm sure there are some, some similarities in, in, in uh, and how we're going to uh, deal with them, yeah. And another one of your policies that I wanted to talk about is uh, you want to, uh, uh, the term, as the term is known, implement criminal justice reform because yeah. it's, it's something that I've learnt uh, during my time in New Zealand that uh, you actually have, I believe, the second highest incarceration yeah, rate in the, right. in the Western world, which really uh, amazed me. In, in Australia, we, we believe that our, our courts and judges are, are not tough enough. There's a lot of violent right. criminals who go back on the street, but certainly in America, where uh, they have the highest incarceration uh, rate in the world, that's 
a lot of that is non-violent uh, offenders. So obviously yeah. there has to be a, a balance, balance between the two. Absolutely, so, yes. So yeah. can you perhaps elaborate on the, the criminal justice problems you have in New Zealand and how you how you want to address it? Absolutely. Okay. And and the the best way to do that probably is is just by telling you a story of of a guy uh, that I met. And uh, so he uh, had ended up um, in. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the beginning. He was he was poor, uh, and he um, was uh, wasn't able to afford uh, to pay for the registration on his car, but he needed his car to be able to work. So he was driving his uh, his car to to, to, to work, um, and and got got caught by a police officer, uh, got given a fine. Um, and uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, told to, to pay his uh, registration and get and get his car up up to date. Um, he wasn't able to pay the fine, uh, at which of course, so that fine escalated, uh, and he was then uh, eventually sentenced to community um, to community work. But in the meantime, he had his car taken off him as part of the fine. He wasn't allowed to drive. Um, so he had no way to get to the community work that he'd been sentenced to. You can see the problem here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so he, so he, you know, got sentenced to more community work, which he couldn't get to. Uh, and eventually, um, the court, out of exasperation, had no other option but to sentence him to jail. Now, when he went to jail, uh, he got recruited to a gang. Uh, and when he came out of jail, uh, he subsequently reoffended. Uh, a far worse offence than anything he had ever done before. So that is a, is a you know is an anecdote which I'm not a massive you know we're an evidence based party, uh, but it really does show you uh, how the criminal justice system uh, in New Zealand can uh, train, actually train criminals. Uh, it's, it's almost like a polytechnic for for uh, for, for crime. Um, so yes, absolutely, there are some violent criminals that we do need to, to lock up, but we have this system at the moment which actually sucks a lot of other people into the vortex too and ends up putting them in prison with those violent offenders and they get trained up to be uh, criminals uh, as, as well. And that makes it even more difficult to solve the problem. And so that's why we have had this growth in our, in our prison population. Uh, and, and what we're talking about is, uh, is is really you know nipping that in in the bud. You know, New Zealand New Zealand isn't twice as bad as the rest of the world, so we don't need to have twice as many people in in prison. Uh, there's other ways that uh, you know you can work you know work with people to uh, to ensure that they are uh, you know appropriately punished in, in a way that doesn't. Uh, lead to that sort of escalation that we see within the New Zealand criminal justice system. So, you know, more early intervention, more prevention, um, more investment in drug and alcohol. I don't know what the issue, situation like, is like in Australia, but some 80% of people in our prisons have drug and alcohol problems, and we don't fund them enough to get drug and alcohol treatment. So only 50% of New Zealanders that ask for drug and alcohol rehab actually get it. So, you know, there's a massive problem there. You need a much greater investment in drug and alcohol treatment uh, to actually stop these people ending up in, in prison. Uh, and I noticed that Australia's incarceration rate, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but ours is basically half of New Zealand's. So you guys are about the OECD average. I think you're slightly above the OECD average, but yeah, yeah. a lot closer. Yeah, yeah. which is in Australia, Australia and New Zealand, we're, we're pretty similar. Uh, yeah. Culturally, and I certainly don't feel that I'm in you know, more danger on the on the streets of New Zealand. <laughs> no, no, exactly. So, so why do we have twice as many people locked up? I think, I think, you know, you've you've hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. Uh, and one other thing that I've—it's uh, not in your policies, but I've noticed in your your blog posts, you're very critical of uh, uh, New Zealand First and Winston Peters. Yeah, why, yeah. why, why, why do you uh, sing, single them out for for criticism? Well, I, I guess it is a, you know, I guess it is a couple of things. Um, you know, one, uh, you know, the, the the major thing is that they are New Zealand's most uh, populist uh, political party. So that so they are furthest from us in terms of uh, you know being evidence based and being you know 
being based on what works is the whole that not left, not right, but what works thing. So, so in terms of our value system, what 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 we think is important is to have as part of um, you know, part of parliament, part of government. They are they're, they're furthest from that in that respect. Um, but I, I guess the other side to it is that you know there we we are they're also our most direct competitors because in New Zealand we have. Um, you know the 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 three major parties uh, are uh, our national party and our Labour Party and Green Party. And Labour and the Greens are both, uh, you know, left wing parties. And National is the centre right. So, uh, so those are the two big blocks. And to form a government, really, either of those two blocks uh, need to work with um, need to work with a centrist party. Uh, and and that that really, uh, you know, the two options there are. Um, uh, New Zealand first or us. Uh, th there is another smaller option as well called the, the Māori Party. Um, uh, so they, they have, um, well it, it depends on how the election goes, but they're, they're another centrist party who are prepared to work with either side. Um, <clears throat> but if you view us as, as a block, you know, New Zealand first and the Opportunities Party slash Māori Party because we get on with them quite well. Um, you know, e either of those could work with um, Labour or National uh, to to form a you know to form a government to to, to um, at least offer them confidence and supply, and um, yeah so there's a, you know there's a there's a little bit of competition there too. What what's wrong with populism in your opinion? Um, I mean I, I guess it is well um, it preys on. On the the worst aspects of uh, of, of human nature, uh, if you like, and and I think in the long term, uh, you know, as we're seeing in uh, in America now with with Trump, uh, I, I think ultimately it, it makes it makes the issue worse. I mean, the kinds of people that uh, have you know voted Trump into into power um, uh, have done so out of out of desperation, and I. You know that, that you know that breaks my heart that these people are in the situation. A lot of these people in America are in the situation that they're in. They, it is a, it, it's a you know um, when you when you see how some people in America and sort of the Appalachians live now, it's 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 quite incredible in a in a modern rich country. Um, but so 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 Trump has appealed to them through through populism. But ultimately, you know his uh, his his policies. Uh, are going to make their lives worse. <laughs> so, so I, I guess um, the, the the biggest concern we have with with populism is is the is it's essentially lying to people in order to to prey on um, to prey on their fears. Uh, and uh, you know, um, we don't uh, you know, that that doesn't sit well with our with our values. We're big on we're big on honesty, which is why we are. Uh, being very upfront with our policy agenda, it's all there. It's all clearly laid out. All of the evidence behind it is clearly laid out. All of the costings are clearly laid out. Um, whereas New Zealand First and Winston Peters, um, I mean, Winston was on one of our major radio stations the other day, uh, RNZ, which is like your ABC, I think, um, uh, and he he couldn't explain where the money was coming from from his policies he just got uh, torn apart by the by the interview I don't know if you heard that but it was it was on the radio the other day um, so uh, you know yeah it's 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 dishonest there would be I mean for, uh, from the other side from uh, I wouldn't want to uh, speak for New Zealand first but they might uh, people who you know think that you know the the voice of the people should 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 be heard and you know populism mm. uh, you know that uh, that's a direct voice of the people. They mm. look mm. at you and your party and say that you know, with these, especially interventionist policies, that you're elitist. Mm. Uh, mm. How do you how do you respond to that accusation? Yeah, well, I mean, I would say firstly, Winston Peters is a lot more interventionist and anti-market than we are. But um, uh, yeah, I mean that 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 is a that is an issue. I mean, I think um, and and that is why people you know relate to. Uh, to, to, to Winston Peters um, because they do think he is he is giving uh, you know the, the, the people a, a voice um, and you know I think this is the difficulty with with setting up any new party is that you don't have a track record so people can't you know uh, 
uh, tell you apart from other politicians and, and, and actually be able to see your, uh, see, see your impact. So, um, you know, uh, I, I think a part of this is, you know, will, will happen with time, uh, you know, as, um, as different political parties get into a position of power and, and can or can't actually deliver on any of their promises. Um, then uh, you know uh, that that will that will become obvious to the public, and they'll be able to um, adjust their expectations in in, in time. Um, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think it it is it is fair to say that uh, you know we are um, you know we we're having to work pretty hard to to sort of reach. The, the kinds of people that would actually benefit from our policies, a lot of working class people, you know, um, would actually benefit enormously from from our from a lot of our policies, um, and uh, you know that's that, that is that is something that uh, you know takes I think takes takes time and and uh, and really really sharp messaging, which to be honest, Winston Peters is excellent at. You know, he is great. Uh, at you know, uh, at, at messaging, at getting across his his messages, you know whether they're accurate or not is a, is an entirely different uh, story. Um, but I mean, the, the the big hope for the Opportunities Party is that we have had an impact reaching out to young people, uh, and um, and I think that bodes well for us in in the future, and that we will continue to build that base. Because our policies are very much focused on providing opportunities for young people, uh, and and that's um, you know a, a, as you say we are pro business and we're pro business because we want young people to have the opportunity to set up businesses and to and to have jobs well you know well paid jobs. Um, so I think I think that's uh, that's the that's the, the the key for the future. Oh, like I said, there's uh, probably a lot where we disagree on, but. I was interested with having having a chat with you, nevertheless, because you Pleasure. you are of uh, an in, interesting party in in this election, and yeah, I wanted to find out more. So thank you, Jeff, for for speaking with the Unshackled. Cheers, Tim. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.